recording. And let me go to the calendar. Yeah, everything is here. The last day is the 7th of December. And today starts the test and the quiz, right? Uh, this information I went over before, but I'll just refresh your memories. Um, let me just take this thing away. Um, so all the information is here. It's on chapter 15 and 17, right? A quiz with 10 point, I mean, 10, sorry, 10 questions like the last time. Um, and I mean, you have two hours, way more time than you need. Don't guess because after the third attempt, you, you will only be able to get 60%. The quiz is, you know, calculations, journal entries, things like that. Do that before the test. And then the test itself, um, you know, discussed already with you guys, but I'll just repeat. You have more than enough time, okay? You have four hours. The test is written. It's supposed to take you about two hours if you've studied. Um, <clears throat> You have uh, supports in the system, but you can opt out of taking them so that you can still, you know, get 100% if you want to. But if you're stuck, you can opt into some of the support, but it will limit your grade. Test is 15% of your overall grade for the class. The quiz is 3% of your overall grade for the class. Um, the, the test is also 10 multiple choice questions, some theory, some application, and then uh, six questions. Please, please, please manage your time. Do not waste time. Even with four hours, which is like double the time you need, people still somehow don't uh, sometimes finish the statement of cash flows, okay? I'm putting the, the questions are in order of... Um, of how we did the work, all right, which I thought was the most logical, as opposed to starting with a cash flow, which is chapter 17 and ending with bonds. So you have bond issued at face value with interest payment and interest accrual, bond issued at a discount, at a premium, bond redemption at and before maturity, journal entries for the mortgage payable and the first two installments, and then a full statement of cash flows, which is a lengthy question. So please don't leave like 20 minutes to do it. You will never finish in 20 minutes all right manage your time this is why you actually have to study and not treat this like an open book thing where you can start paging around looking for answers once you start the the test okay so please study um you can get good points on this test especially the bond stuff it's very straightforward it's the same like what we did in class and for homework and i'll go over the chapter uh, 17 homework now all right so again that opened this morning at nine, I mean, I don't obviously expect anybody to be doing it this morning. I just opened it. I just consistently open the stuff at the same time so that I don't get confused about when it's supposed to open. So you have it open from 9 a.m. today till 6 p.m. next week, Tuesday. You can take it at any point during that time. Does anybody have uh, questions about the mechanics here of taking the test or the quiz or anything before I go over the chapter 17 and more? Right, so use this sheet, please, when you're studying. This is not a troll. This is real. This is what I'm going to ask you. You don't have to try to guess what's going to be on the test. It's all written down. And remember, it's timed. So you can't, if you walk away from your desk or something, the clock uh, keeps ticking. And again, due dates. I know I've said this now like a million times, but the chapter 17 homework is due today. You obviously have Thanksgiving on Thursday. Just a reminder again, I said this before, but today is a Thursday schedule at LaGuardia. Obviously you're seeing me because we see each other on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but um, if you have some other classes that meet on a Thursday, they pro they'll probably meet today. Um, and then, yeah, when I see you, by, by the time I see you next week, Tuesday, that's the last day that the test and the quiz are open, and we'll just continue with chapter 18. Chapter 18, so homework is going to be due um, on the last day that we see each other, the 7th. On this day, I'll review with you. I'll go over the final exam review questions um, that are also on Wiley Plus, and then... Um, the final exam will open on the 9th and close on the 14th. All right, so please mark your calendars if you haven't already so that you can make sure that you are leaving enough time to study for the final as well. At the last day to withdraw from any class, sorry, this got cut off, but it's Wednesday, the 8th of, De of December. So if you think that you need to withdraw from this class, obviously talk to me before you do anything like that. Talk to me first, but if you need to withdraw from this class or any other class, the last 
absolute last day to do that, to still get a W grade is Wednesday, the 8th of December by midnight. Don't uh, mess this up, okay? Because if you think you want to withdraw from a class and you uh, this is a, it's a hard deadline, right? If you think you want to withdraw from a class and you don't do it by Wednesday, the 8th of December, you won't be able to do it. And so you'll either have to take a very low grade in the class after you do the, the um, you know, the final, or you'll have to take an unofficial withdrawal, which is like an F grade or some other thing. So, so just be aware that, yeah, in the last two or so weeks of class, if there are decisions to be made, please make them early so you don't end up in a situation where you are trying to speak to the registrar to get withdrawn from a course after the fact. They, they're probably not going to allow you to do it. Um, there's also the no credit policy. Um, again, the semester we've had it in the past with the pandemic, you're allowed to choose uh, no credit if you get an F in a class, but only up to four credits. Um, so I can put, I can bring up, I, I, I'd have to look for it during the break. I can't remember all the ins and outs now, but um, that is an option that is available after um, after the last day that the grades are due, uh, students can opt in to have one class be no credit. That means that if you did get an F in a class, you could change it to no credit. The F won't count against you at LaGuardia. You can take the class again. But at, in fact, the, the, the no credit is a, is a CUNY-wide policy, excuse me. But if you transfer somewhere other outside of CUNY or whatever, the F is going to come back onto your transfer transcript. Okay, so just... Don't plan to fail some things that you can do, no credit, because not only will you have to repeat the course, but the F is also still gonna stand on your transfer um, transcript. I'm just saying that the no credit policy is there to avoid you know, a complete catastrophe. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a question. Um, is the, is the um... Is the final also fifteen percent, or is or is that going to be way more? So it's are you are you on Blackboard? You got to get on a Blackboard, okay? Everything is there. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, see. No, the problem the problem is that I have an app an Apple T uh, an Apple uh, computer, so every time I try to do that, like it makes me download it for some reason. Yeah, you got to sort that out because this is critical. I mean, for instance, the test and quiz information, you need to be able to access that. So can mm -hmm. you access maybe through a different device? It's, it's a high grade. It's, it's a high weighting. It's 30% of your grade. This mm -hmm. is also in the syllabus. Um, so if you download the syllabus, you'd have access to, to the, um, the grade weighting. So homework is 5% per homework. We know that already. The two tests are 15% each. The quizzes are 3% each. The um, bio we discussed already, you guys did it, it's 2% and the final uh, practice questions is 2%. Okay. okay. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Other questions, people, about anything? Okay, so my department also just um, asked me to make sure that I uh, tell students to please um, register for fall two if you think you want to um, take a class in, in fall two and you haven't registered yet. Remember, you can take a, a few classes in, in fall two to, to keep moving. It is six weeks, so you've got to be careful not to overload yourself. But um, I have a list of classes that are still available um, for people to register for fall two. So please uh, register because these classes will get canceled if um, people don't register. For the, if you wake up late and realize like, oh my word, I should have taken a class in the six weeks. I'm not gonna be doing anything else. Those classes may already be canceled. Plus the cancellation affects you know, other people who want the class, but then can't have the class because not enough people enrolled. So if you think that you need to enroll in something, please do that. Yes, Michelle. Um. Do you, by any chance, do you know uh, what's the deadline to upload like the vaccine information for spring? Yes, I do. Um, I do. Let me find it. Uh, <laughs> hang on. I know, Professor. Go for it. 
It's February 23rd. I know because it's my birthday. Hey, <laughs> and another, another February birthday. All right. I'm also, I'm also in February. Thank you. Who's speaking? Thank you so much. The homie. The homie. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. She was speaking, yes, Michelle, about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. no, no, I said, thank you. No, no, I meant you, oh, Jahomi. Right. I was thank oh. you for telling us what the date was because I know I've I've seen that date multiple times now, and I and I yeah. So let me tell you what the um. Let me also tell you what and oh, this is why I'm getting confused. If you are registering, I got confused because the the president sent information, but this was about fall two. If you if you registered for fall two and you are in person or hybrid, your documentation has to be uploaded by December eleven. Okay, that's for fall two, and then for for uh, to Jaume's point, um, for for the uh, spring, your documentation needs to be uploaded by. Um, by, what did you say, February 23rd, right? But yes. we got to be careful here because just if you to have documentation by February the 23rd, you have to make sure that you are already vaccinated, right? So you can't, I, I mean, I'm sure this makes total sense to everybody, but I just want to be clear that you, you can't only now, you know, be waiting to go and get vaccinated in February. You should be counting back a month from then to to see the dates and they did give us the dates but for some reason i'm now completely uh i, I don't have all my ducks in a row here so if someone wants the exact date by when they need to take the first shot in order to um to be on track for um for february the 23rd we can look it up but for now i'm a little bit discombobulated but thanks so so december 11 for fall to February the 23rd for the spring, you've got to have your stuff uploaded, which means you either must have had both shots out of a two shot uh, vac uh, vaccine, or you must have had one shot of the Johnson & Johnson. Other questions? Oh, someone asked me how many classes you can take in fall two that was John, but I'm not recommending this John, but you can take up to nine credits. Okay, that's three classes, but I think it's a bad idea because in the six weeks, it's, I teach in the six weeks, it goes by like, I mean, if you think the 12 weeks is fast, the six weeks goes by in a flash and taking, you know, so many classes in six weeks can be completely like problematic, especially if you're working and so on. So, um, so I think the better play is, is to do either one or two classes, but I think you can do up to three classes, but you may need to get special permission to do that. People sometimes do that when they're trying to graduate, but again, um, it's tough. All right, so other questions about registration, vaccination, fall to anything? Professor, the only question I had is, um, what class are you teaching in uh, session two? The same. Uh, the same. Accounting okay. two. Okay. Yeah, but it's and it's asynchronous. Uh, so you, you know these people don't see me in in session two. It's asynchronous. Um, the I the classes I teach are, are this, and I teach um, first year seminar in the spring. I'll teach that, and I also teach the intermediate accounting to the capstone course. Um, those those are about what I generally teach. I sometimes teach accounting one also. Yeah. Okay, I took mm -hmm. um, accounting one asynchronous in session two of spring. That's what. That's how I had it. We never saw a professor. <laughs> that's, that's rough. Uh, that's pretty rough going because that's an introduction to accounting asynchronous is, is, is hard. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. Imagine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know, and, and uh, John, to your point about taking two classes in six weeks and it's not so bad, depends which classes you're taking, right? Because I teach accounting, maybe I'm biased towards saying that it's hard to do stuff in the six weeks because I know how much work it is, but it could be that you're taking classes that are fairly chill. Um, in yeah, the six I weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely, sorry to cut you off, but no, um, yeah, for these next, the second session, I'll be taking people work organization. And then the other one is uh, public speaking. speaking. Okay. So yeah, I, I think that, it'll be okay for six weeks since I already went through that and it was terrible, but I did economics and 
accounting one and I don't even know how I aced it yeah, I'm gonna be honest I was yeah I was all over the place with numbers right. I think you probably just have to balance in the six weeks where you might be taking one heavy course and one not so bad your your combo sounds good all right, people, so register, register, register for two. If you want to see the listing of courses, I can show you during the break. They sent it to us yesterday or the day before. Um, that's the admin That's the admin stuff. I don't know if I'm taking public speaking. Okay, yeah, so C is saying maybe you guys will be in the same class. That would be nice um, to see familiar faces again. So let's go into, um, into chapter 17 again. I know the homework is only due this afternoon, but um, uh, one of your colleagues asked me if it would be possible to go over it because we won't um, see each other on Thursday and because obviously the, the test and stuff is coming up. So I am starting. So I'm starting now with chapter 17's homework. All right. So it's wait, I can barely read this. Sorry. Um, so starting with brief exercise 17.1, again, if you have another screen you can use to log into Wiley, maybe you can follow along, even if you can just check your work or maybe start doing your work, God forbid, at this point, um, you know, this should help. Each of these items must be considered in preparing a statement of cash flows for Urban Company for the year ended December 31, 2022. For each item, state how it should be shown in the statement of cash flows. So remember when we're thinking about about uh, cash flows, it's either cash uh, coming in or cash going out. So cash inflow, or cash outflow. And you're looking at three um, different activities, right? Operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. And obviously there is another activity, a fourth one, which is significant non-cash activities, right? Because some of the things might be uh, non-cash. In this case, there aren't any, but I, I, don't, I don't want to just ignore that. So we issued bonds for 20,000 cash. Immediately when you're seeing bonds, you should be thinking financing activities. When you're thinking about issuing bonds, that's what we did in chapter 15. Issue a bond, you receive cash and you have the liability, right? So you're receiving cash. So it's a cash inflow and it's financing activities. All right. That's that's what's being asked over here. Purchased equipment for 180,000 cash. So when you purchase equipment, you debit equipment, you credit cash. So cash is going down, right? So it's a cash outflow. Anything to do with buying assets like equipment, property, things like that is investing activities. So it's a cash outflow from investing activities. You sold land costing $20,000 for $20,000 cash. So you sold the land at a book value. So they're trying to avoid showing a gain or a loss because they just want you to deal with one um, activity. So selling some asset means that you are receiving cash because you're giving up the asset. So it's a cash inflow. And because it's land, it falls under investing activities. All right. And then we declared and paid a $50,000 dividend. Dividends paid will be part of financing activities. And because we paid the dividend, it's a cash outflow. So I'll give you 20 seconds here to just think about this and see if we have any questions. Okay, no questions at this point, so I'm gonna move on. So here's more uh, testing, just right, your theoretical um, understanding of, of the cash flow of where things go. An analysis of comparative balance sheets, the current year's income statement and the general ledger accounts of Haley Corporation uncovered the following items. Assume all items involve cash unless there's information to the contrary. Indicate how each item should be classified in the statement of cash flows indirect method, which is the cash flow we've been doing all along, using these four major classifications. Operating activity, that is, the item would be listed among the adjustments to net income to determine net cash provided by operating activities under the indirect method. So the other talking about the three adjustments to net income, right? Adding back non-cash expenses, adding losses or deducting gains, right? That's number two. And number three is the changes in non-cash current assets and current liabilities. 
investing activities and financing activities. And then the, here we go with the significant non-cash investing and financing activities. So they're going to give you a, a transaction and you're going to say where it fits in to these four categories. Right? Exchange of land for patents. So you're giving up land and receiving a patent in exchange. There's no cash involved. Land and the patent are part of investing activities, not financing activities. So this is... <clears throat> Oh, I guess they're doing a combination thing, so it doesn't matter. So this is a not significant non-cash investing and or financing activity. It would be an investing activity, but they're using um, one title for, for, for both types of activities. Okay, so non-cash because you're exchanging one asset for another. Sale of building at book value, so there's no gain or loss, so this is just an investing activity. If there was a gain or loss, it would also include operating activities because you have to adjust in um, operating activities for gain or loss. But selling something at book value means you make no gain or loss because the amount of cash you receive is the same as the amount that you're carrying the asset on your books. Okay, so just investing activity. Payment of dividends is a financing activity. We just discussed that in the previous question. Depreciation of plant assets. This is the non-cash expense that you add back in operating activities. <clears throat> Conversion of bonds into common stock. So you're giving up the, the giving up a common stock to basically pay off your bonds. That's a non-cash activity. There's no cash involved there because you're exchanging again basically one financing instrument for an, another in a way. So you're you're um, issuing stock and using that. Uh, basically the issuance of the stock as a payment for the bond. So it's a significant non-cash activity. It would be a financing activity. Issuance of capital stock. So yeah, it's not stock issued for some other failing of a liability or for an asset. So this is a financing activity. We're assuming that the other side of this transaction was cash. All right. Amortization of patent. I've said before that amortization is like depreciation, but for intangible assets, you learned about intangible assets in accounting one um, when you did classified balance sheets. An intangible asset is an asset. It's just that um, it doesn't have a physical substance, but there is value to it. So a patent is when you invent something and um, you are able to prevent anybody else from creating the same thing. And you are the one who gets all the money from that thing. But the patent doesn't go on forever. It lasts for about 20 years. So you have to amortize it, which is like a type of depreciation, right? So that's also a non-cash expense, just like depreciation is a non-cash expense. So that gets added back to net income under operating activities. We've gone A through G. Does anybody have questions up to you? Oops. All right. Issuance of bond for land. Again, you're, you're, there's no cash involved. You're receiving land. You're issuing bonds. So this is a significant non-cash activity. It would be, um, I guess, investing and financing um, because the bonds fall under financing. A purchase of land. So this is not buying land and using some non-cash thing to pay for it. So this is an actual investing activity. A loss on disposal of plant assets. Remember, losses are added back in the operating activities to adjust uh, net income. So that loss specifically is an operating activity. And then the retirement of bonds. Remember, retirement, repayment, um, those all mean the same thing. You're paying back the money on the bond. That's part of your financing activities. All right. So we've gone A through K. Does anybody have questions on any of those uh, activities? A through K. So first, just to be sure, the H1 issuance of bonds for land, mm -hmm. it, it gives both of those, right? Investing and financing mm -hmm. activity, mm -hmm. which exactly is it falling under? It's both. 
because I mean, first of all, it's not going to go into the cash flow, right? You do understand that it's not actually going to be shown in the cash flow because it's a non cash activity. You'll write it at the bottom of the cash flow, right? Issuance of bond for land and the amount. But technically, it impacts investing and financing activities because the land is part of investing activities and the bond is part of financing activities but because it's a non-cash activity it won't show up in the cash flow it will just be written up at the bottom of the cash flow okay thank you professor all right no problem what else anybody And so just to be clear, uh, I didn't say, I mean, I've said this now to Shafak, but I just want to be clear that everybody understands when something is a significant non-cash activity, it's just going to be written up at the bottom of the cash flow. It will not show up in the actual statement of cash flows. It shouldn't, okay, because it's non-cash. Um, you will just write it up at the end. All right, so let's see what's happening here. Concord uh, Corporation had the following transactions. And so it says for each transaction above, prepare the journal entry. So now you should be saying, why are we asked to do this, right? Aren't we supposed to be doing statement of cash flows? Why are we doing journal entries? Part of the reason for having you, you know, it's, all these examples are priming you to be able to build a cash flow. In order to build a cash flow, you have to understand the different activities, right? Operating, investing, financing, non-cash activities. You have to understand which types of items go into them. You have to understand when something is an inflow or an outflow. And a lot of understanding the inflow versus outflow or how the transaction is being treated is actually understanding the journal entry that that transaction would um, result in. So again, these journal entries are not busy work. They're actually part of priming you to see that you understand what the transaction looks like in a journal. And wherever you see cash, that means that the thing is going into the statement of cash flows and you'll have to know which activities it goes into. All right. So sold land for cost with a cost, excuse me, of 8,400 for 10,500. So and again, if you're following in your questions, obviously you have different numbers to me. Okay, so don't panic. Um, it's algorithmic. We all have different numbers, but the, the concept is the same. So first of all, excuse me, you see that the cash is more than um, the cost of the land. So there's going to be a gain over here. Um, then the cash itself is 10,500. The cost of the land is 8,400. So the way we build this journal entry for the disposal is you debit cash because cash is going up. Uh, it's an asset by 10,500. Land, the asset is going down on the credit side by 8,400 because you're selling it. So you have to get rid of it. And then the difference between those two is a credit of 2,100, which is a gain. Again, the gain you could have calculated just by looking at the difference between the cash received and the cost of the land. The cost of the land is the same as book value of the land because land is not depreciated. Questions on number one. Issued common stock at par for 23,300. So they're trying to tell you there's no paid in capital in excess of par value, right? So when you issue stock, you debit cash and you credit common stock. So notice how this is pulling at things that you learned in previous chapters, right? I'm sure people were getting maybe annoyed by that, but, but that's part of accounting. It always builds on, right? They build the stuff builds on each other. So here's the cash. So, sorry, I should have done this over here, pardon me. Over here, I should have said, although it's not asked in the question, this gain will be adjusted for in operating activities. You will subtract the gain. This cash will show in investing activities as um, the sale of land, all right? That's how you think about this. The actual cash amount shows up in investing activities and the actual gain or loss shows up in operating activities. Over here, in financing activities, you'll have 23,300 from the issuance of the stock. Recorded depreciation on buildings for 16,900. So I've gone over this journal entry before in our class, but you also learned that in accounting one is the journal entry for depreciation. It's always the same debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. So there you have it. So 16,900, 16,900 
right? So what happens with this? This is the non-cash expense that gets added back to net income in operating activities. Again, you weren't asked to explain this in the question, but I'm just trying to show you how these things tie back in. Paid salaries of 7,800. <clears throat> Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there's a part B where you are asked to buy this. <laughs> paid, sorry, paid salaries. Um, so debit salaries and wages, 7,800. Credit cash, 7,800. So with this one, there's some confusion when people talk about whether it impacts the cash flow or not. This number is already included in net income. Okay, so you're not, there's no further adjustment to anything on the cash flow for salaries and wages. It, it just stays in net income, you don't adjust for it. And then uh, five issued 1400 shares of $1 par value common stock for equipment with 8800. So you can already see that this is an issuance of, of stock for equipment. So it's a non cash activity. Um, but let's work through the journal entry. Um, <clears throat> so you're going to debit equipment for 8,800. Uh, you're going to credit common stock with 1,400. And then you're going to credit paid in capital in excess of par for the common stock for 7,400. So I repeat, this is an issuance of stock for a non-cash asset. It tells you that the equipment is worth 8,800. So that's the debit. And then remember, common stock is always the number of shares times the par value. So that's where the 1400 comes from. And the, and the difference is the paid in capital in excess of par. I'll finish the last journal and you guys ask me questions on, on anything that you have here. Sold equipment with a cost of 12,300 and accumulated depreciation of 8,610 for 1476. So this is the cash that you received. So you debit cash with 1476, all right? You have to get rid of, it's a disposal. So, so we go through those steps. You receive the cash, so you debit cash. You have to get rid of the asset, so you have to credit the asset with a cost, 12,300 credit to equipment. Accumulated depreciation is usually a credit balance because it's a contract asset. So to get rid of it, you have to debit accumulated depreciation. All right, and then there's a loss. Sorry, I need to drink some water. And then there's a loss on disposal. You can calculate the loss by saying there's 12,300 on the credit side, there's 8610 and 1476 on the debit. So we need another debit of 2214, okay? So we'll always debit the accumulation depreciation? For disposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me do the math here quickly for this loss. Sorry, I'm just going to bring out my beloved calculator. So let's, let's see, right? How do you calculate if there's a gain or a loss? You take the difference between the book value and the cash that you're going to receive. And in fact, you know, it's probably easier if I actually just do this. I'll just randomly do this on a on a spreadsheet because um, I realized that doing it on the calculator is still not going to help. So you've, you've got a cost here. Um, this is just the gain or the loss thing, right? Gain or loss. The, the students usually get stuck on this. So that's why I'm just spending, not on this particular question, I'm just saying gain or loss in general. To figure out the gain or loss, um, let me actually do this. You're going to say, what is the cash? And then what is the book value, right? And book value of the asset is, is defined. So it's cost minus accumulated depreciation. Okay. So what's the cost? What's the accumulated depreciation? That's going to give us book value. So I'm going to go back here. Where am I? Nope. Yes. Okay. So cost 12,300 for my example, right? 12,300 accumulated depreciation is 8610. So this then tells me, again, you can just get to this by balancing out the journal entry, but you know, this is important also because sometimes we need to um, calculate gain or loss as part of, the, of completing a statement of cash flows. So this is your book value. Again, book value is a defined term, cost minus accumulated depreciation. 
So you know the book value is 3690. This is what the company thinks the asset is worth, okay? This is what the company is carrying the asset at. But what they receive for it is 1476. This is what they receive for it. And so is the loss because the cash received is less than the book value and the loss is going to be a debit, right? The loss is always a debit and again is a credit. It's like a loss is like expenses. It goes on the debit side and again goes on the credit side. So here's how you think through a gain or a loss or you populate everything else, you put in the equipment, you put in the accumulated depreciation, you put in the cash, and then you just uh, balance out the, the, and this is what I was gonna show you on the calculator. So you say, okay, there's 12,300 on the debit side. I know the cash is 1476. I know the asset is, I mean, the accumulated depreciation is 8610 on the debit side. So then how much do I still have to put on the debit side? 2214, so that the dollar amount of debits and credits is the same. There have to be questions here, yeah, one through six. Somebody has something that they want me to go over again. I can feel it. Can you show again the other um, screen where you were writing? Oh yeah, sure. In it in my notebook. Thank you. Anything else? Do you have it, see? Are you good? Okay, okay, no worries. Tell, tell me when you're done. I just don't want to sit on this when if you're already done, but if you're not done, that's fine. And remember, guys, this is the same approach you can take for calculating any gain or loss, right? The difference between the cash or the proceeds and the book value is going to tell you whether there's a gain or a loss. If the cash is less then the book value, it's a loss. If the cash is more than the book value, it's a gain. A gain is a credit, a loss is a debit. Okay, so can you repeat that one more time? Cash less than book yeah, value. I'm gonna write it here. How about that? Better, right? If, oh, let me just do the cash, less than, where's my less than sign? Book value equals loss, right? So debit. Cash greater than book value equals gain, so credit. And we know that book value is defined as cost minus accumulated depreciation. Okay, I'm done. All right. Thank you. No worries. Hear about it. Shafak, are you good? Yes, Professor, thank okay, you. Okay, great. So that's the deal. Now we come to part B, unless somebody else has something else they want to ask me. Uh, oh, I think there's a part B. Am I going crazy? I don't know there should be one. Maybe it's question four, yeah. So this is the same uh, scenarios for whatever reason, the numbers are like, I guess they can't do algorithm, algorithmic numbers on the essay part. So you're not gonna see the same numbers as what you had before, but it's all the same um, transactions, all right? And so what they're asking is for each of it, for each transaction above, indicate how it would affect the statement of cash flows using the indirect method. So you basically have to toggle between what you just did um, you know, over here 
and answering the question on the other side. So if we look at number one, we know that there's going to be a cash inflow into investing activities. And we also know that we will have to deduct a gain in operating activities. So there's two impacts, okay, for that first one. There's investing activities cash in and operating activities subtract the gain. And if you're wondering why we're subtracting a gain, remember we're doing, we're doing a, as part of the adjustments that you make to, um, to net income. You have to memorize that if you can't remember it, okay? So yeah, you can see, again, we're working with the numbers from, from this, you know, these changed numbers. So I'll just work with them. The cash, you don't have to write so long, guys. You can say, you know, 15,000 um, cash inflow in investing activities. That's that's what's happening. And then they're talking about a 3,000 gain because the gain over here, the cash was 15,000, the cost is 12,000. So the gain of 3,000 is deducted from net income. You could even, um, you could even, I mean, I'd even accept it if people left out the amounts and just said, you know, cash inflow in investing activities, gain deducted in operating activities. Because I, I find it a little bit annoying that the numbers change between part A and B of the question. So it's extra work. You have to figure out the number again. Questions here with, with the impact on the statement of cash flows, anybody? All right. Common stock was the next one. So. Uh, cash inflow in financing activities because we issued common stock depreciation is number three. So we already know that's going to be added to net income in the operating activities section, right? This is what they're going for. They're trying to see for those journal entries that you just made, do you understand how these amounts impact the statement of cash flows? Number four is where some people sometimes get uh, confused. Remember I just said, when we were doing the journal entry, that this recording of the salaries and wages, this number is already in net income and there's no adjustment necessary, okay? It's, it's got nothing to do with um, non-cash or anything like that. So over here, you see they say salaries and wages expense is not reported separately on the statement of cash flows. It is part of the computation of net income on the income statement and it is included in the net income amount on the statement of cash flows. So there's no need uh, to, to make any kind of adjustments. You can just say no adjustment um, needed, doesn't show up in the cash flow, however you want to phrase it, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not needed. All right. Issued a thousand shares of one dollar power value common stock for equipment. We already spoke, we already did this journal entry, but I'll I'll just show you again. This journal entry did not involve cash at all. So it's going to be a non-cash activity in part B, we'll talk about it over here. Issuance of common stock uh, for equipment is reported as a significant non-cash investing and financing activity at the bottom of the statement of cash flows, all right, because there's no cash involved. And then the last one, we sold equipment, right? This was the one that we were just doing with a loss. So there's a loss and there's also cash coming in. So cash inflow in investing activities and the loss is added. Remember the three adjustments, losses are added to net income because you're trying to eliminate the impact of the loss so that you can deal with the transaction fully in investing activities. So that's the B part, it's probably the most, the part where people kind of get stuck a little bit because they actually have to think through you know, what's happening with those amounts. I think the trickiest ones are remembering that when there's a sale, there's the gain or the loss and the investing activities. So it's operating activities and investing activities you have to consider. That's in number one and number six. And then also I think this number four where salaries and wages don't impact um, or don't require any additional, uh, you know, adjustments on the statement of cash flows. That one people usually get wrong. Questions on this one through six? But four, it's not operating activity, I'm confused. No, because they're asking, right? You, they're asking you how it would affect the statement of cash flows using the indirect method. What they mean is, will there be a line item for this thing on the cash flow? Right. And so you're saying, no, there's no separate line item needed because the salaries and wages is already in net income. You don't have another line item saying salaries and wages somewhere on the cash flow. It's not needed. 
because it's part of the expense. Mm -hmm. That's already, that's already. And if there was some part of that expense that had not yet been paid, then you would make the adjustment through accrued expenses or something like that. But it wouldn't be like, maybe if there's a salaries and wages payable account that would also be adjusted as part of current liabilities, then the payable would show up in that adjustment, but the expense account is never going to be a separate item on the cash flow. Okay. Um, can I change it in my homework? You can, do whatever, you can do whatever you want. Everyone's, this is open season. You guys can listen to what I'm saying and change your answers. I think the only problem, the only problem with the written thing is that, um, and you know, I actually, went and spoke to the rep about this because some people, you know, when I re reset the question for them, they lost their answer. I think it was Jahomi or someone. And she told me not to reset the question. I have to go in and mark it incorrect, but it won't affect your grade because then you'll have another op opportunity to do it again because you have unlimited um, opportunities. So if you haven't, sub if you've submitted it, I have to mark it incorrect and you can fix it. If you haven't submitted it, you should be able to change your answer. So you can submit it. So yeah, so I can in the break, I'll just, I'll just reopen it. So you, anybody else who needs me to reopen it, happy to do it. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Shall I move on or does anybody have other questions? All right. So we keep pushing on. Okay, so here's a T account example. We had a T account like this as number five in our examples for chapter 17. So you've seen this, even though, you know, you may have been not, you know, you may be like, I've never seen this before in my life. We did in fact do this. So hopefully this rings a bell. Um, the T accounts for equipment and the related accumulated depreciation for equipment for Flounder Company at the end of 2022 are shown here. There's a beginning balance of equipment for 79,200. Acquisitions just means they bought extra equipment for 44,800. Disposal, so they sold equipment of 20,700 to give an ending balance of 103,300. Remember, we add these two numbers. Equipment is an asset, so it goes up on the debit side. We add these two numbers and subtract this one to get to the ending balance. Then you've got accumulated depreciation on equipment. Remember, accumulated depreciation is a contra asset. So the normal balance is on the credit side, right on the right hand side. So the beginning balance, 43,600. Depreciation expense for the year, 14,300. Disposals, so the, the asset that was sold had depreciation of 5,700. Ending balance, 52,200. Questions on the T accounts before we even look at the, the actual question. Can you explain again what each one means? Each one what, ba balance? Yeah, like disposal. Disposals mean sale. Yeah. Disposal is a fancy word for saying it was sold. And acquisition means purchase. All right. And I think the balances are obvious, right? Beginning and ending. Mm -hmm. So the language is a little bit. But it was purchased for 44,800. And, mm -hmm. and a sale, but a sale of, of, of equipment for of a cost of 20,700. The balance would be the loss or the gain the end balance no it's this it's the end balance it's just the balance in equipment there's no gain you're not yet at the gain or the loss no okay no you're not going to get a gain or a loss out of the equipment account you have to calculate the gain or the loss yourself or what's given to you in a question mm -hmm. because to get to a gain or loss you have to compare cash to book value right because that, the mm -hmm. beginning balance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay all right so let's look. In addition, Flounder's income statements reported, there we have it, a loss on the disposal of plant assets of 3,000. What amount was reported on the statement of cash flows as cash flow from sale of equipment? So the easiest way, in my opinion, to do this is to try and recreate the journal entry. You can do it other ways. I can show you more than one way. But um, if you know how to do the journal entry, it makes your life a whole lot easier. So I'm gonna put debits and credits here, right? So the number that, that we're looking for is cash. Okay, they're asking you, what is the cash number, um, right? What's the cash flow? Uh, you are only looking for 
you know, obviously this loss is going to be in the journal entry and you're looking for anything that says disposal, right? So you can see accumulated depreciation has to be debited, the equipment has to be credited, and the loss we already know from before is a debit, right? So over here, what we say is loss, right? Loss on sale or loss on disposal, um, 3,000. Accumulated depreciation is also a debit, as I said before, because it's a contra asset. So when you decrease the balance, you debit it. And it's shown on the T account as a debit. So that's 5,700. And then the asset equipment is credited. 20,700. So what you have to do here now is try and, and calculate this number, right? So we go back to our calculator. And so you know that the credit side is bigger because there's a number missing here. So you're going to say 20,700 minus 5,700 minus 3,000. And the answer is 12,000. So 12,000 is the catch that was um, received. And I believe that it is in agreement yeah, with the answer, okay? So that's one way of figuring this out. The other way of figuring it out is, um, is what we were doing before, which was using this gain or loss thing, the gain or loss um, calculation. So if you know that cash, well, we don't know what the cash is, sorry. <clears throat> this is another way, it's, a, it's faster. Cash minus the book value is going to give you the loss. The loss was 3,000. We know that there's a $3,000 loss. So now the question is, how much is the book value? Well, it's a defined term, right? It's cost, 20,700 minus accumulated depreciation of 5,700. I don't know, maybe this isn't as quick as, as I think, but you know, for those people who don't feel like doing a journal entry, this should be faster. So the book value here is 15,000, all right? That's book value for this um, asset cost minus accumulated depreciation. We know that the book value is 15,000 and we know that there's a $3,000 loss, then it must mean that the cash is 12,000 less. I mean, not, it's 3,000 less than the, the book value, which is 12,000. So this is another way of doing the same thing. Um, so if you want the journal entry, you have to remember what to debit or credit, or you can just do these calculations. Either way, you'll get to the same answer. Questions on that? I'll leave it up for a bit so people can take notes. Okay, so no questions. Hopefully everyone's done taking notes now. So 12,000 is the answer here. What I'm gonna do, we've still got four questions left here. I'm gonna have us uh, take a break now until 11.42. And then when we come back, we'll just push on with this homework um, and see where we get to. If we have to uh, only do a little bit of chapter 18, that's fine. All right, so let's take a break here for 10 minutes. You, you, uh, Sam, are you saying you need to go back to the Excel spreadsheet? I don't know what copy means. What does that mean? Oh, oh, you mean copy as in as in military copy? I <laughs> got you. Sorry, <laughs> so you meant you needed to copy one of the answers. Okay, I'm back. 
All right, so I'm gonna stop the share so I can just reset. Uh, is there anybody besides C who needs me to reopen the, um, the solution for, what was this question? 17.3b. Uh, Anybody else who needs me to reopen 17.3b, please put your name in the chat so I can do that. Okay. Enjoy your break. Hey, Professor, good question. Mm, what's up? Um, so um, previous years before the pandemic, let's say a student had to take a summer course, right? Uh, would they still have been able to, to do the ceremony or no? Yeah, they did. It was always a little bit weird because some people would come to the ceremony and then they have to run home to go study for the exam. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I don't have to take any classes during the summer, but just asking for a friend of mine that, that he has to take two, I mean, one class during the summer, and he also is going to graduate. Yeah, no, it was fine. It was fine. It was kind of known that um, that some people would have to do that. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. Okay, professor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can still march. Well, that's if we have a march this year, hopefully. Yeah, or march virtually or whatever. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, professor. Okay, see, I don't know if you're there, but um, I'm gonna mark your thing as incorrect. That's what I was told to do. So I, we can save so that your attempt is, is saved and you don't lose your work. Mm -hmm. And then you can go back in and fix whatever you need to fix, okay? Okay, thank you. Because if I reset it, you will lose your work. Right, so break's over and I'll start back with the next question on the homework, number six. Um, <clears throat> Vaughan Inc. reported net income of 2.45 million in 2022. Depreciation for the year was 156,800. Accounts receivable decreased 343,000 and accounts payable decreased 274,400. Compute net cash provided by operating activities using the indirect method. So they're basically... Um, giving you a net income number and testing you on two out of the three adjustments that you make to net income. They didn't give you a gain or a loss here. Um, basically, you just need to know that you add back depreciation expense, and then you need to know what to do with the current asset um, decrease and what to do with the current liability decrease, okay? Um, and one is, you know, one is a plus and one is a minus, basically. You can see here you have to um, know that the statement of cash flows is for a period of time. So it's for the year ended, December 31, 2022. Cash flows from operating activities is the starting heading. Then you've got net income, 2,450,000 or whatever amounts you guys have on your examples. Adjustments to reconcile net income to net cash provided by operating activities. If it had been a negative number, it would say net cash used by operating, but it's, it's a positive number, so it's going to be provided by operating activities. The depreciation expense is added back, so it's a positive number. It was given right at the top, 156800 Accounts receivable decreased, which means you collected money from your customers, so that's good for you. So you add 343,000. Again, accounts receivable decreased means you collected money from customers. So it's a positive. You can also just go by the rules, right? A decrease in a current asset is added back. And then accounts payable decreasing means that you paid money to your suppliers. So your cash went down. So that's going to be a minus, all right? Or you can just follow, again, follow the um, follow the rules that a decrease in the current liability is a subtraction, all right? 
And so these three numbers together, add these two and subtract this one, gives you a total of 225,400. And the 2,450 plus the 225,400 together give you net cash provided by operating activities in my example of $2,675,400. Questions? Yeah. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, Shafak, yes, go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, Professor, like you said that accounts receivable decrease means money received oh, from the clients. Um, does it also, I mean, how does it apply for accounts payable decrease? That you paid money, because if you think of the journal entry, when you paid accounts payable, it's debit accounts payable, credit cash, so cash is going down. So that's what's a minus. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so that was just a, a straight um, operating activity section, right? We've done many of those together. So, I mean, for the most part, I would hope that you are able to get through it. Um, exercise 17.4, this is a also operating activity section. Sunland Company reported net income of 194,300 for 2022. Um, so there's your net income number. Sunland also reported depreciation expense of 46,800 and a loss of 5,900. So there's a loss that's different now. We haven't seen a loss yet for you guys to work with in, in the cash flow on the disposal of plant assets. Remember, loss gets added back. The comparative balance sheets show an increase in accounts receivable of 19,800, right? So if an increase in accounts receivable means you didn't get extra money from, or get the money from your customers, so you've got to subtract that. And 21,800 increase in accounts payable, so it's the opposite. You can add that back because that means you kept money behind. You didn't pay your accounts payable. And the 3,400 increase in prepaid expenses also subtraction. The, the prepaid expense is going to move in the same direction as accounts receivable because they're both current assets. Remember, if you're finding this very confusing, like thinking through the changes in the current assets and current liabilities, they are rules in the notes, in the textbook, right? And what to do if there's an increase in a current asset, what to do if there's an increase in a current liability, you can just study one half of it because then the other half will obviously just be the opposite, okay? So however you figure it out to make peace with this, whether it's through actually understanding the logic behind it or just memorizing the rules, just figure out a way, okay? Because this is gonna come up in the, in the cash flow. Um, so, it's for the year ended again. We spoke about that cash flows from operating activities, net income taken straight from the question, adjustments, depreciation expense, 46,800. There it's being added back. The loss of 5,900 being added back per the rules, right? Add back the non-cash expense, add any losses or deduct any gains. And now you do the changes in the non-cash current assets and current liabilities, right? So again, it's only non-cash current assets and current life, but please don't try to put the change in cash here. We are trying to explain the change in cash, okay? So increase in accounts receivable is a minus, increase in prepaid expense is a minus, increase in accounts payable is a plus. I've already gone over the reasoning behind it. These numbers together add up to, in my example, 51,300. That 51,300 is added to the 194,300 to get to net cash provided by operating activities of 245,600. So that's, and so you may wonder why do we have so many examples of operating activities and not a whole cash flow? The operating activity section is by far the hardest, okay? Every other section, you just put the cash related to that section um, next to whatever you're doing, right, for that activity. So operating activities is, is, is really where a lot of the action is. Anybody have questions for this one? I'll give you a minute to just digest and think and maybe 
maybe you have some type of question that you, or some clarification that you need. Take a minute until 12, well, just in 12, so take another half a minute to just think through what I'm doing here. Looks like people are either asleep or okay. All right. So here we come to a nice juicy example, right? With all the trimmings. Can you tell I'm thinking about Thanksgiving food already? All right. So Benito corporations come, thank, thankfully I don't really have to cook, thank God. Um, we can go and eat where somebody else is cooking. I'm too tired for that. Hopefully you guys, if you are cooking, I hope you have the energy for it. Benita Corporation's comparative balance sheets are presented below. Um, so here goes the balance sheet. So already you know that you need to end on 15,000 for this cash flow or whatever number you have, okay? The answer is there. 15,000 is the ending balance on my cash flow. The increase in cash for the year needs to be 5,000. The beginning cash is 10,000. So just by looking at the balance sheet, you already know the answer in the cash flow. It is now a matter of, um, of putting you know, those numbers into the right places. <clears throat> and you've got some accounts receivable. So there's a current asset that you have to adjust for. You've got, got accounts payable as well. There seems to be some action in land. There's no action in buildings so nothing was bought or sold here. Uh, probably have to take depreciation either as the change in accumulated depreciation or um, maybe you're given the number if you're lucky. Common stock, there's definitely a change over there. So you've got to see if that was for cash. Retained earnings, you don't have to uh, account for the change in retained earnings. You'll just look at where the dividends were paid, okay? So, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. So obviously, you know, going through this is, is I'm, I can start to see the patterns, but my hope is that as you practice, you start to see which numbers might be relevant. And now we see what the additional information says. Okay, net income was 23,100. So we have the beginning number. Dividends declared 15,000. That's an outflow in financing activities. No non-cash investing and financing activities occurred during 2022. So why are they saying that? They're trying to tell you that anything that happened was for cash. So it looks like land was sold. It must have been for cash. Yeah, it looks like stock was issued. It must have been for cash because all everything was non-cash. Then it does tell us that land was sold for cash of $5,000, right? So $5,000 is, is what we got for the land. But let's see what the cost of the land is that was sold. I had a balance of $25,700. i am left with a balance of $20,400. So the book value of the land, remember land isn't depreciated, so book value is the same as cost. The book value of the land is $5,300, and it was sold for $5,000. That means I made a gain or loss. The cash is $5,000. The book value is $5,300. Tell me in the chat, do you think it's a gain or a loss? Okay, we have one person voting for a loss. We have one person voting for a gain. We have another person voting for a loss. Okay, so we have a mixture here of, of things. The loss is starting to win. Jacob says that it's a $300 loss. Okay, so let's... Sorry, not that. Um, let's double check. The loss is, is correct. So we'll just double check our, our math. So the cash you received is 5,000. The book value is cost minus accumulated depreciation. Cost, let me just go back here. Cost over here. Well, I have to tell you what I calculated the cost as 5,300. That was the cost of the land that was sold. Sorry, I had a moment, momentary freeze in my brain. There's no accumulated depreciation. 
So book value is the same as cost. Why is there no cumulative depreciation? Because land is not depreciated because we don't have an estimated useful life because land could be, I mean, we could be on this earth forever, not us, but the earth, right? So <clears throat> is this a gain or a loss? I ask again, the cash, where's my little uh, cheat sheet that I wrote for, for Shafak? The cash is less than the book value. So it's a loss, okay? The cash is 5,000. The book value is 5,300, a loss of 300. That's what we have uh, to work with. So that loss, sorry, I may have left this too soon if people are taking notes. So that loss is going to be added back um, as part of the adjustments to net income. The $300 loss will be added back. The cash that was, um, received is going to be an inflow in investing activities, all right? So going back here, let's see what's happening. Okay, so same deal, it's for a period of time, cash flows from operating activities is the first line. Net income, you got the numbers straight off additional information, right? 23, 100. Depreciation expense, what's happening here? We didn't get given a number, so where do we get that number from? You gotta look at the change in accumulated depreciation, all right? So if, we're, if we have 15,000 ending balance, and we have a 10,900 starting balance, it must mean that the additional depreciation for the year was 4,100, all right? So we can do it this way because there was no change in the building's um, balance. So we can just take 4,100 as our depreciation um, expense. Does anybody have questions about that? Yes, Professor. Um... At the next question, they give the depreciate the accumulated depreciation in the balance sheet and then the depreciation expense in the income statement. And then we ignore the, the, the accumulated depreciation on the because, balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Because if there's any sale of an asset, then this is a shortcut. Okay. If if there's any sale of, of buildings, you can't take this shortcut because um that would mean that some depreciation was eliminated for the year. So the shortcut is not gonna give you the right answer. So sometimes the question will give you depreciation expense number to just make your life easier because they already know that if you just look at the change in accumulated depreciation, you may not come to the same answer. I think that's what I demonstrated the other day um, to you guys in a T account because you have to remember that, um, and let me just see what's happening. Okay, I don't know what happened there. Um, let me just show you quickly. When you look at the accumulated depreciation T account, right? So accumulated depreciation. This is a, a notorious account for people to struggle with. Why? Um, and that's why I'm taking the time to do it. People struggle with why the, you know, why you can sometimes take the balance on the account and why you can't sometimes take it. So that's how it looks, okay? So you have the beginning. I'm just gonna write stuff in. I'm not gonna do any calculations. You have the beginning balance there. You have depreciation expense for the year over there. On this side, if there's any sale, you have to account for it like that. And then, you know, at the end of, of the year or whatever, you're going to have an ending balance, okay? If there's no sale, which was the case uh, for, in fact, let me just show it for this example. There was no sale. I know that because the building's balance, first of all, they told me there was no sale. And also the building's balance stayed exactly the same, right? So what I can say then is, okay, so I started with 10,900. I ended with, sorry, I'm like not able to remember anything today, apparently, 15,000. So then since the sale number is zero, it must then mean that the depreciation expense for the year is the difference between these two numbers, right? Which is what I calculated, 4,100. If there had been a sale, Let's just, you know, throw some number in. If there had been a sale for 
for let's say 2000 or something over here, you can't just take the change in the beginning and ending balance as being depreciation expense. The depreciation expense number will change. Let me uh, copy this over and show you again. Let's just say for argument's sake that, sorry, that you do have these two numbers and then you have a sale of let's say 2000, right? There was accumulated depreciation that was eliminated as part of a sale and the accumulated depreciation was 2000. Your depreciation expense for the year is no longer 4,100. You agree, right? Yes, because, right? Yeah, because now you have to say, how do I get from 10,900 to 15,000, but I also lost 2000. So what's the answer actually here? Anybody? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Six thousand one hundred. So then, so then your depreciation expense is actually six thousand one hundred. But if you looked just at this change, you would say the depreciation is four thousand one hundred. But it's not. You know, if they had said there was a sale of two thousand, then you would have had to account for that as well. So I can take the change in accumulated depreciation to get to depreciation expense in this example specifically because there hasn't been any sale of buildings, right? I think it was buildings. There hasn't been any sale of buildings. If there had been any type of sale of buildings, I would not just be able to take the change. I would have to take the sale into consideration and that changes my depreciation expense number. So this is why when you were saying in the next example, they give you the accumulated depreciation, which they have to, because they're showing you a balance sheet. I mean, the balance sheet would be incomplete if they didn't show accumulated depreciation, but they also show you depreciation expense in the income statement and that could be for two reasons. It could just be that they want to show a whole income statement, but it could also be because they know that if you take the change in accumulated depreciation, you're not going to get to the correct depreciation expense number. Okay, but until now, they didn't let us uh, calculate depreciation expense with a sale, right? I mean, we didn't get any example like this. I haven't done it. You haven't done it. And I don't think you're yeah. going to do it because in the one example where you could do it, they give you the depreciation expense number. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Life was made super easy, right? All right. So there's the 4,100 that I've now shown you in different ways, right? You can either take the change in accumulated depreciation because there was no sale, or you can go and actually create the depreciation, accumulated depreciation, excuse me, account, and you still will end up in the same position, right? So you add back the 4,100. There's the loss that we just calculated of 300. Remember I said the loss is going to be added back. There's the loss, right? You received cash of 5,000. The book value of the land that was sold was 5,300. So a loss of 300 is added back. Again, your numbers are different to mine, but the mechanics are the same. All right, so you know, don't try to put my numbers into your question. Obviously, it's not going to work, but the mechanics will be the same. Then the decrease in accounts receivable, you're literally just looking at um, the change in the balance. There's obviously a decrease, which means you collected money from your customers. That's a positive for you, 2100, right? Plus 2100. Accounts payable. Uh, also goes down, but that means that you paid cash out right to your suppliers. So that's going to be a minus in operating activities, negative 18,200. These amounts together give you a negative 11,700, which is subtracted from the 23,100 to still give you net cash provided by operating activities because this is a positive number over here, but it's much lower, right, than what you started with. So you have a positive 11,400. Any further questions on operating activities before I go through the rest of the activities? Professor, did, did we get kicked out? I got kicked out. No, we didn't get kicked out. I can't hear you. Hold on. Hello? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you perfectly fine. Okay, now I can hear you. Okay. Now I can hear you. <laughs> there must have been some uh, tech issue on your side because we're still, yeah? Okay, got it. Okay, no worries. Um, 
Okay, so let's see what's next. Uh, cash flows from investing activities is the next thing. There's only one thing that happened here, the sale of land for $5,000. There's the information, cash of 5,000 was received. If you look at all the other assets, it's only land where there was any action, right? Buildings, nothing happened. So it's just the sale. Um, sorry, hang on a second. It's just the sale of land, 5,000, is an inflow. Remember when you sell something, cash comes in, okay? Don't get confused with that. Net cash provided by investing activities, 5,000. You're done with investing activities. And this is why I said, this is why there's so much time often spent on operating activities because the other activities can be fairly straightforward. Then cash flows from financing activities, you, you have to look at, and, and this is why you, you can't just look at additional information and ignore everything else, because look, there's a change in, in common stock of 3,600. This means that they issued stock for $3,600 because there were no non-cash activities. So, and there's also dividends of 15,000 that's paid. So cash came in from the issuance of stock, 3,600, and then the payment of dividends, 15,000, that's cash flowing out, right? because you're paying the dividends to investors. So for financing activities, it's net cash used by, right? Financing activities, because it's a negative amount. For whatever crazy reason, these two amounts are the same. One is positive, one's negative, but you know, don't, they have nothing to do with each other. It's just coincidence here on my example. Questions for investing or financing activities. Okay, <clears throat> so now what's next? Now you say the, you know, oh, sorry, someone asked me a question. Oh, good morning, okay, oh, welcome. Um, net crash provided by operating activities, the 11,400, to that you add 5,000, right? Remember, we're adding all the activities together to see if there was an increase or decrease in cash. So 11,400 plus the 5,000, Minus 11,400, obviously these two numbers cancel each other out. So it's just gonna be the 5,000 net increase in cash, which remember we, we saw was the change on the balance sheet from 10,000 to 15,000. The beginning cash is 10,000 in my example and the ending cash is 15,000. And so that's the end of the, of the cash flow. Questions, anybody? So we do have a B part here, which is calculating free cash flow. You may recall that I went over this with you, that free cash flow has a formula attached to it, right? It's the net cash provided by operating activities minus any um, what they call capital expenses, which is basically investing in any uh, property, factories, machine, equipment, things like that, and then minus any dividends that are paid. I'll repeat, it's the net cash provided by operating activities minus any capital expenses. So that's investing in anything like property, plant, and equipment minus dividends. This is in your textbook. We've gone over it, all right? Yeah, I mean, it's part of the material. So you could be asked to do free cash for an exam, of course. Um, so free cash flow for this example, uh, net cash provided by operating activities, 11,400. There's no um, purchase of property, plant, or equipment in this question. So the capital expenses is zero, all right? It, it would not be zero if there was something that was being bought. You're only looking for things that were being bought. And then the dividend is 15,000. So you're subtracting the dividend of 15,000. So in my example, the free cash flow for this company is actually negative. That's 3,600 because they're paying, they, their operations only generate 11,400 in cash, but they're paying out 15,000 in dividends. So they've got negative free cash flow. So if you were looking to buy this company, um, you probably would not be too, excited about the state of the, the cash flows because if you needed to buy um, new equipment or, or you know anything after you purchase the company, there may not be enough cash to do that. 
uh, questions on free cash flow other than whether it's on the test. Yes, it's part of the topics that are covered in this chapter. So it's it's a candidate for being on, you know, in any part of the test. <clears throat> Anything else? All right, so that's exercise 17.8. So here comes the last one, 17.9. Um, Waterway Inc., another cash flow big one. This is why I'm saying for those people that haven't even started the homework, you have to be very careful. Yeah, the homework is due this afternoon at six, and there's a lot of work to be done. I'm going over this again because I won't see you on Thursday, and you guys have a test and a quiz that opened this morning. So I want to make sure that people iron out any issues in their thinking that they may have. But, um, you know, don't wait until five o'clock this afternoon to start the homework. You'll never finish. Remember, every homework counts 5% of your grade. These grades are not... You're not able to make this up at some later stage. It's 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 you know done after today. Um, okay, so here's the cash. This cash went up to 109, 700. Immediately, you already know that 109, 700 is the amount. And again, this is my numbers, but whatever your number is here, this is the number that you should be ending on for cash at the end of the period. And then over here, the difference between these two numbers is the net increase in cash. Again, now you have quite a few um, current assets. You've got accounts, receivable inventory and prepaid expenses. Long-term investments is not a current asset, obviously. I mean, the name implies that it's long-term, but it would be part of the investing activity section. Plant assets is another name for things like buildings, machines, equipment. They're just throwing it all into one category. So that's also part of investing activities if something is happening over here with these plant assets. Um, and maybe if there's a gain or a loss, that would be part of operating activities. There's the accumulated depreciation that you're talking about. Um, you know, that, that we were talking about earlier that the difference in these two numbers is not going to give us depreciation expense. Already, it's obvious that that's the case because there's been a decrease in the accumulated depreciation. So, I mean, you can't have negative depreciation expense for the year. And the decrease is because something must have been sold, okay? And so maybe some things were bought and some things were sold. Here's accounts payable and accrued expenses payable. These are the two current assets that we will have to uh, adjust for those balances in operating activities. Then you've got bonds payable has a change in the balance as well. So we have to see whether that was for cash or non-cash. Common stock also has a change in the balance. And remember the change in retained earnings you can ignore because you'll account for that through net income and also through any dividends, all right? So that's the um, balance sheet. And then we're also given an income statement. You do not have to adjust for individual items in the income statement other than taking the net income number, which is what we start with. You need to look for your depreciation expense, which you have over here. And then you also have to add back the loss that's given over here. So this cost of goods sold, interest, expense, all those things, don't make any adjustments. Remember net income plus or minus three adjustments, that's it. So don't get confused now and think that you have to start uh, changing net income for all these things. You only need to look for non-cash expenses like depreciation expense, add back the loss, and then make your changes for the current assets and current liabilities, all right? And start with 175, 900 or whatever your net income number is. And so we um, go through uh, the additional information to see what's happening. New plant assets costing 80,500 were purchased for cash during the year. So that's gonna go into investing activities and that's a cash outflow, all right? Here comes the sale, old plant assets having an original cost of 47,300 and accumulated depreciation of 36,900 was sold for 2,900 cash. Now, if you wanted to, you don't have to, but if you wanted to, you would be able to calculate and see that that loss pops out of 7,500. You don't have to do it. You already have the loss over here. You need this cash number as a cash inflow in investing activities, okay? That's why you need that line of information, okay? You need that cash inflow on investing activities. 
bonds payable, matured, and were paid off at face value for cash. So this then means that that change in the bond number was an actual cash activity, all right? So this is gonna be an outflow in financing activities because you are debiting bonds payable, you're paying off the bond and you're crediting cash, okay? Your cash is going down because you have to pay off your bonds. This is bonds that, um, you know, this from chapter 15. A cash dividend of 31,000 was declared and paid during the year. That's gonna be a cash outflow in financing activities, all right? And common stock was issued at par for cash. So this increase in common stock is equal to uh, the, the amount of cash that flowed in. So this is a cash inflow under financing activities. And then there were no significant non-cash transactions. So thanks for that, right? <laughs> After they told us all the transactions already were for cash. Now they're just making sure that they you know, cover the final thought here that there's no non-cash transactions. So we know every change that happened in a balance sheet account is related to actual cash movements. Does anybody have questions on the just the fact pattern before I even start going through the actual cash flow? Just any questions on the additional information or, or the information that we've been given, something that you don't understand, anything like that. I'll give you a minute to just process the question before I even start going over the cash flow. And you can ask me anything during that time. Do you mind calculating the loss? Just mm -hmm. I can do that. As soon as as soon as the minute is over, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? All right, so I haven't gotten any other questions you know, in the chat, so I'll just calculate the loss. The question was, can you show us how they got to the loss of 7,500 in case we have to calculate the loss ourselves? So let's just say you weren't given a loss and you were given this information, right? That's the, that's the question. So I'm just gonna go over here again and do you know the gain for you. Although at this point, someone may be looking for some alcohol, uh, not me. <laughs> so cash, um, book value, and now um, you you want to see whether there's a gain or a loss. So we're going to go with what's the cost, what's the accumulated depreciation, and that will tell us what's the book value, and then we'll pop that book value back into the top uh, calculation. All right, that's what that's what we will do shortly. All right, so here we go. The cost is 47,300. Accumulated depreciation, I think was 36,900, but I can just check myself, 36,900, yeah. So the book value is cost minus accumulated depreciation, 10,400, okay? So 10,400 is my book value over here. What's the cash that I received? <clears throat> Excuse me. They tell you that it's 2,900, right? So 2,900 is the cash for this example. So if I received 2,900, but I thought the thing was worth 10,400, I must have made a loss of 7,500. You got it? Yes, I just finished copying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm in copy. I just want to make sure that's clear. So that's how you could calculate the loss. Remember, if the cash is less than the book value, it's a loss. If the cash is more than the book value, it's a gain. And a loss is a debit. But when it comes to the cash flow, the adjustment is that a loss will be added back and a gain will be deducted. 
All right. Yeah, Eric. So let's look at the cash flow. Same deal. You have to put that it's for a period of time. Cash flows from operating activities. Net income taken straight off the income statement. All right, one seventy five nine hundred for my example. Again, adjustments to reconcile. Uh, net cash in this case provided by operating activities because it's going to be a positive number. Depreciation expense picked up straight off of these guys, these people that really want me to sign into Cortana. Um, depreciation expense is picked up straight off the income statement 31100 added back. Do not take the change in accumulated depreciation. You're going to end up with a negative number. 31,100 is added back. Loss on disposal of plant assets added back at 7,500 straight from the income statement. Notice how I'm not taking anything else from the income statement besides those three things, net income, depreciation, and the loss. If it had been a gain, I would obviously take that as well. Now you've got the changes in uh, your current assets. There's an increase in accounts receivable, meaning we didn't collect money from people. So it's a subtraction, okay? Increase in inventory, same direction as accounts receivable because it's a current asset, also a subtraction. Increase in prepaid expenses, current asset, just like accounts receivable, also a subtraction. So they all increased, they're all subtracted. Okay, because they're all current assets, so they go in the same direction. The rule says if there's an increase in a current asset, we minus. That's the rule. And then increase in accounts payable. So accounts payable went up. It means we didn't pay our bills. Basically, we kept cash behind, so we added. And then a decrease in accrued expenses payable. That means we did pay off some of those expenses, so we subtracted. And all this whole line of things together, plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, minus, right? Watch your calculator here, watch the math. These all come to a positive number in my case of 6,800. That 6,800 plus the 175,900 gives you net cash provided by operating activities of 182,700. I will let this simmer for 30 seconds. And if people have questions, feel free to ask now. And uh, we are not taking we are not taking anything uh, like we are not taking everything from the income statement because everything we don't take is going to be on the balance sheet already, right? Yeah, it's already net income, and any adjustments you need to make for anything you make you make the adjustments through the current assets and current liabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Follow the rules, right? Just three adjustments: add back the non-cash expenses. Add the loss or deduct the gain. Add or deduct the changes in current assets and current liabilities. That's it. Don't mess with cost of goods sold or, you know, whatever uh, other operating expenses or income tax expense not needed. You you already you've already accounted for those things. This goes back to. Um, that question we had earlier where they asked you, like, what's the impact of each of these things on the cash flow? And we were talking through salaries and wages expense that doesn't have a separate line item on the cash flow. It's the same idea. Interest expense is not going to have a separate line item. If there's interest payable as a current liability, maybe that would be. But the expense itself, no. The only expense that you see in the operating activity section is the non-cash expense depreciation expense. All right, other questions, guys, for operating activities before I move on? Okay, so investing activities, what do we have here? It's, they're starting with the sale. So there was a sale of the plant assets of 2,900. There was a purchase of plant assets, which would be an outflow of 80,500, right? I don't know if there's anything else. Long-term investment, see how it's sneaky, right? Because there's no mention of long-term investments being bought, but you have to watch out the changes in the balances. There was an increase. So that means we must have purchased some long-term investments as well. 
So let's see what's what's happening. So there's the sale of the plant assets, right? There's the purchase of the investments that I was just talking about. They didn't mention that in additional information, but they did say that all the, the activities, or there were no significant non-cash activities. So that means that the change in the investment balance was a purchase for cash. So in my case, that's 26,300. Remember, a purchase is a minus. Cash is going out. A sale is a plus because cash is coming in. Purchase of plant assets was given in additional information, 80,500. And because all of this ends up negative, especially because this 80,500 is such a massive negative number, this becomes net cash used by investing activities. Questions, anybody? I'm letting it simmer for a minute, and then you ask me anything that you want. All right, we come to financing activities. We're rounding the corner to the end. Um, I'll be collapsing at the finish line along with you. <laughs> so cash flow from financing activities, right? Um, so it's going to be, com it's got to do with the common stock. It's got anything to do with bonds and anything to do with dividends, right? So if you go look uh, back up here, you see that Bonds payable obviously went down, common stock went up, and then we had this dividend, and they did tell us that common stock was issued for cash, so it's a cash inflow. Bonds were paid off, so that's a cash outflow. A dividend of 31000 was paid, so that's also a cash outflow. So let's see what they did. Here's the issuance of common stock for cash, cash in, right? You debit cash, you credit common stock. Redemption of bonds, paying off the bond, cash out. Debit bonds payable, credit cash. Cash is going out. Payment of dividends, debit dividends payable, credit cash, cash is going out. So this becomes a negative number, right? Because of these two large negatives. So that's net cash used by financing activities of 17,000. I'm letting it summer again for a bit so people can get their bearings or ask any questions. All right. So then we know the drill already. Now you add together whatever is net cash provided by operating activities, net cash used by investing activities, minus 103, net cash used by financing activities, minus 17. Those, excuse me, items together give you a net increase in cash of 61,800. Cash at the beginning of the period, you take straight off of the balance sheet. There, 47,900. That's the beginning number. And the ending number, 109,700, should be the same as the cash for the, the ending cash for the current year, 109,700.
Okay, so that's the end of the homework. Um, if there are any other, you know, as you've looked, hopefully you've followed along maybe in your own homework, if there are other questions um, that people have or something to clarify, take the time now to ask me or to check to see if there's something that you need to ask me. I'll let this simmer again for another minute or so. All right, so this extended uh, walk through the homework for um, chapter 17 has not left us with really any time to, to get back to chapter 18. So I will just um, remind you, I think everyone's kind of either now in chapter 17 mode or just exhausted um, from going over all of that. So I'll just remind you that the chapter 18 notes are here. Um, I'm obviously not seeing you on Thursday, but next week, Tuesday, we'll be hitting this fairly hard. We had started going through a little bit, um, you know, of, and, and I was ready to, to go through some of that again. Um, today, we started going through the notes, right, a little bit last time. I, and um, this, this chapter is largely formula driven. Um, what we'll be doing is using these formulas that come up over here. I'll show you how to use them. I'll explain to you what they mean. And we'll just be going through various examples and calculating these formulas so that in the end, just so I'm just saying this so you guys know, in the end, um, you know, for me, it's not about you necessarily memorizing a formula because you can have the formula in front of you. It's being able to use the formula and understand what it's telling you about how the company is uh, doing. So again, a big part of the liquidity, profitability, and solvency work that we'll do together is, is learning how to use these formulas and you know explaining their meaning and looking maybe at one changes year over year for companies. And then the last part, um, of the chapters just about something called uh, well of different types of income but specifically comprehensive income and discontinued operations so um next time when we come together on tuesday that's what uh, we will we will spend the whole period doing that and the next um the next class after that and, and then we should have wrapped up chapter 18, I may have to cut one or two additional examples that I would have done because I've lost at least an hour, if not more of the time on chapter 18 today. But I think it was time well spent. That's, you know, I think given the questions people had and, and you know, some of the uh, confusion that was hopefully, you know, clarified, I, I think it was time well spent. So I'll close out here by just reminding you that anything to do with the test and quiz is already and has been up. I mean, I went over the stuff with you guys last week already. Um, has been up since the beginning of the semester, frankly. It's open today at 9 a.m. You have until next week, Tuesday at 6 p.m. to finish the test and the quiz. It's the same grading as, as, as the last one, 3% for the quiz and 15% for the test, all right? So um, I will stop the recording here.